All right, people, so we're jumping back into it. So um, transition fossils, um, these are those types of fossils that would help kind of explain what we call kind of jumps and traits, right? Um, we have fish swim in the ocean, and we have uh, amphibians kind of moving out of the water, but, you know, where did, where did arms, where did legs, like how did those evolve, where did they come from? So, like, what would, like, half an arm look like? What would half a leg look like? Um, how is that beneficial? Um, other examples like lungs, right? So how do you go from gills to lungs? What would the in-between have looked like? This kind of transition um, fossil. Um, hands, right? Another one. Um, how do we get hands out of like flippers if we really came from fish? So this was a tough question for Darwin to answer. Um, so as far as hands go, these are pretty cool uh, little fish here. Um, climbing perch, I believe they're called, or like walking perch. Um, so these are going to be in areas where they actually have like um, temporary like water beds so that like water will dry out and these fish will have to walk and find more water so you can kind of see you know there was that selective pressure of nature of losing the water uh, which forced these fish to have to cope with that right and so fish that maybe had stronger flippers um, maybe more bones different shape bones could actually walk a little bit better from kind of like drying out pond to drying out pond. Um, you know, if these fish were just in a lake and the lake always had water in it, would there be any pressure to develop hands that would help them walk? No. Um, and again, um, I know I say like develop like they were trying to do this, but no, it was just kind of random mutations. The ones that actually could survive and walk to the next ponds were the ones that would breed and reproduce and they would pass these kind of better traits on. So again, it was completely random, but the nature's uh, pressure of um, selecting for these traits was kind of like not random, right? So that's a tough concept to get uh, kind of stuck in your head. All right, so here's lungs. Um, you guys are about to watch one of my favorite videos. Um, you're going to see some like lung fish here. Um, so if you're going to walk around on dry ground, well, you got to be able to learn how to breathe right, and especially dry air. Um, you know, water is wet, so we will not have that discussion, but um, you, you get oxygen, you know, uh, fish do through their gills, which is basically bringing in that dissolved oxygen in the water and coming into their body. Whereas um, land creatures, terrestrial creatures, uh, you know, we can breathe it in, but there's so little water in the air that would actually like dry out our bodies relatively fast. Um, so we've developed kind of respiratory tracts that will humidify the air as we breathe it in, right? That's why like our lungs aren't exposed to the air like gills are, like gills being exposed to water. It has to go up through our nose, down our trachea, through the bronchi, and all along the way it's going from like 1% water and humidifying. So it's like when it gets in the lungs, it's like really humid. It's kind of like foggy looking. Um, uh, or you can imagine like that, just so much uh, water is uh, now part of it. And then when you breathe out, we lose, uh, we like steal some of that water back into our body, but we actually lose, do lose a lot. So, you know, you dry out every time you talk. Um, you fall asleep in class, right, with your mouth open and your mouth gets really dry because the water's just rushing out of you. All right, so that was a weird tangent, but lungfish, um, check out this video, um, watch it through. Um, again, notice the transition of their environment, how they're kind of being water, but then not water, and you can see how nature is selecting for having uh, the ability to kind of gulp air. You'll see these guys have uh, a swim bladder, um, and that's going to be kind of what we think are like the earliest lungs. A fish's normal slim bladder is what allows it to kind of float up in water and then sink down in water and their body moves them kind of forward and backwards. But it's this kind of like bladder, kind of like your urinary bladder, right? But it's, it's filled with air that they can like pull in air and release air so they can kind of buoy you up and down. Well, the lungfish use it to gulp in air so they can squiggle to the next uh, pond or dig into the mud and hibernate. All right, if you're following along with the PowerPoint PDFs, we are switching to the last one, part three now. Um, so go ahead and flip over that if you're following along with those. It's much shorter. All right, so we're just about done with the evidence for evolution. Um, 
you can kind of see we got to talk about embryology and DNA and DNA you guys have already seen a lot of so easy peasy um, you can kind of see the puzzle we used to do so we talked about geographic talked about Lucy talked about comparative anatomy make sure you know these terms get through those um, but these guys right here embryos so embryology the study of embryos can you kind of tell what species they are by looking at them uh, maybe look at that right there look a little turtle to you so that's a turtle a turtle um, here this one Check out the ears, the little tail. This is actually a house cat. And then this weird alien looking one. Well, that is you. That is the Homo sapiens embryo. Um, so what's kind of cool is when we look at embryos, especially among kind of related species like mammals or what we call vertebrates, just things with backbones. So yeah, a turtle does have a backbone here. It's literally attached to its shell. Um, we can kind of see uh, similarities in how they have developed. Um, so I usually do a little puzzle where you guys cut out all these uh, pictures of embryos at kind of different stages of development and you have to kind of match them up and put them in order. Um, but this is what it looks like. Um, so, you know, if you look at all these, they all look pretty darn similar, right? Well, this is six different species of organisms. Um, and so, yeah, they all look like weird little alien snakes or worms or something. Um, but these right here, these are actually gill slits. Um, so even us humans, we had what are called pharyngeal gill slits. So in the womb, we all started out with tiny little gills. So that tells you something about maybe our relatedness to other organisms and maybe how we may have evolved. All right, so this would be a really early embryo. So like sperm and egg have fertilized. It's been developing for a while. And then, boom, we got this stage. And then... We're developing a little bit more, and now you're starting to see some differentiation, right? You can see, oh, these look very similar to each other. Uh, the rest kind of seem similar to each other, especially maybe these middle two and these far two, right? It's kind of getting like weird kind of head shapes, different shapes popping out. Some nubs for appendages, a little nub, mm, kind of a nub, not really though, right? Um, but yep, yeah, long tails, tails. Hmm. And then the last stage, psh. Now you actually see uh, the species of these organisms. So if we start down here, and it's kind of in order of uh, how we think evolution happened, kind of. Um, so we got fish, right? You can see how, all right, well, amphibians share a lot with fish, right? So they are looking more and more related, especially the further back you go. Uh, tortoises, chickens, birds and reptiles. Birds actually came from reptiles. We'll talk about how dinosaurs and birds are interrelated. But again, that's why they kind of look grouped together the same. Uh, and then we think mammals, kind of like birds, popped out of reptiles. Um, so here's sheep, here's human. Notice these two kind of look the same. So the mammal developments look very similar. So again, in embryology, yeah, we all started off very similar. Why would we start off with gills if we end up losing them, right? probably has a lot to do with maybe what we have evolved from having and sharing a common ancestor. So especially among vertebrates, things with backbones, um, we, we share DNA even with fish, right? It's not a lot of DNA, but if we look back, then it makes it seem more likely that, oh, we do share some similar DNA with them. All right, so that's embryology. This is a really cool video you guys can check out uh, on your own. It is definitely optional, but it, it basically goes through uh, human uh, fertilization and development and how, like, a, a sperm and egg fertilize and would actually get to, like, this stage. So kind of the stage we kind of skipped over. So feel free to check that out if you want. It's a really cool video. All right, so moving on, um, if you're going to pick out an elephant's closest living relative, kind of like humans and chimps, you know, which one of these organisms would you pick? Uh, right, hippo maybe, yeah, maybe the rhino in Africa, it's a big giant anteater. Uh, it's actually none of those things, it's actually this tiny little or like rodent organism, it's called the hyrax, and literally... We, you know, we've used comparative anatomy to compare things, right? So if you look at their body structures and stuff, you're like, oh, these like have to be more related to an elephant. But then with the discovery of DNA, um, and we started coding the sequences of all these organisms, you know, we've had to change some of our maps of who's related to who. And actually, evolutionarily, these two are, for whatever reason, very closely related, so it's, it's pretty fascinating. If you go to the San Diego Zoo, they have a whole exhibit on it, and they've got these little hyraxes running around. Um, they just split off um, very closely to each other. So yeah, elephants, they're both mammals. Elephants kind of lost its kind of uh, 
uh, furry coating and stuff and obviously gotten way huge it's like looks way different but yeah this is kind of one of those oddball uh, facts of nature um, so when you look at that, uh, our last piece of evidence DNA we've already talked about all this right you know there's only really like one letter difference between humans and uh, chimpanzees and then just a few more letter differences between those humans and gorillas um, and so if we kind of look at this right we can see if we're going to stack up all these um, different species and let's say this is a gene for uh, hemoglobin so like blood right well obviously would expect us to have a pretty different gene compared to lamprey right those are those creepy looking like little blood sucker things um, pretty far away from frogs but frogs are ooh, amphibians so terrestrial now we're getting to chickens now we're getting to mice also mammals here's the rhesus monkey very closely related to how we make our blood and then humans right so you can see uh, the kind of evolutionary difference and the dna difference as well right they usually go hand in hand um, so again just to recap uh, genes make proteins and so, all right, yeah, the difference between a horse and a zebra was probably not that big, but a horse and a gorilla would be bigger. A horse and a chimp, even more. Human and a chimp, yeah, in some genes we actually have exactly the same gene, which is weird to think about. Uh, human and gorilla a little bit bigger. Um, so yeah, kind of kind of fascinating uh, stuff. Um, so this is our last uh, lecture right here. This video is kind of a long one, so sorry, go th get through it. Um, um, but yeah, that is the end of Evidence for Evolution, so good work, people.